we have arrived at OK, and I want to welcome everybody to the study. And uh, I guess we're going to be welcoming some on YouTube who are not here this morning with us uh, later. And those who join us regularly on YouTube, welcome to YouTube. So that would be uh, oh, Brother Ray, Brother Joe, Brother Richard, scattered all over the Midwest of the United States and all the way out to Melbourne, Australia, and Lance in South uh, Spokane County in his ghillie suit, uh, making the world safe for whatever it is he needs to make it safe for with uh, ghillie suits, firearms, and the rest of it. We are still in Ephesians 4. Now, I told an untruth <laughs> last week. Not meaning to, uh, not meaning that it'd be untrue last week. However, I said we would be getting in chapter five, and that from oh twenty five on, this is already self explanatory. When Frank asked if we were going to be in Ephesians four or five, it tells me recording is progress, and I'm guessing you can hear it now. All right, we're going to begin in verse twenty five of chapter four because when I heard what I said. Last week, I could not believe that Frank stayed in his chair. The impression that it gave is that, well, chapter 4 up to verse 24 is, you know, kind of tough. And so you need some teachers to help on that one. And the rest was kind of self-explanatory, not of none of which is true. Every time, you know, how many times have you heard me say that no part of this scripture is any more important or any less important than any other part? That part is true of Ephesians 4 as well. Furthermore, I don't want to leave the impression that you need me to teach it. You have the best teacher you can have in the Holy Spirit himself, who has promised to lead you into all truth. Now, he may choose to use me. He may choose to use your pastor. He may choose you in speaking to your neighbor. He can use any of that. He can speak directly to your heart. But, so I apologize to you for having said what I said and the implications that it gave. I have repented of that. And so we are going to begin in verse uh, 25 of chapter 4, which reads, Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And then you have this Thunderstroke of verse uh, 32. Be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. I would pray this morning that God's revelation and his spirit be upon these words as we consider them. Let's go back to verse 25. Wherefore, putting away lying. Now, I have a definition for lying, which is my own, I uh, although I do recommend it. Um, and maybe I'm, maybe I'm uh, making too fine a distinction here, but for me, a lie is an untrue statement which is told to the detriment of the hearer. A true lie is not told to benefit who is being told to, in other words. A uh, salesman lies to you, it's because he wants you to have his product and he wants to have your money. And a lie told for that is not for your benefit, it's for his. On the same token, if the... Uh, uh, if the purchaser, let's say it's a car salesman, and you're, what you want to do is trade yours in, and you say a few things which are untrue about your trade-in value, it's not to the benefit of your hearer either. You can see how this works both ways. I'm not talking about, how do you feel today? Oh, I'm fine. When you're really not fine. I'm not talking about that. That's not to the detriment of the hearer. And I want to speak also about what, where the first lie comes from and what Paul in Ephesians is referring to. Because he's not talking about casual conversation here. Wherefore, putting away, lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor for members one of another. Now, that has to do with daily living, but it also has to do with uh, corporate worship. So let me ask you this, and as you think about it, as we read these words over again, put away, lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. You remember Jesus one time was asked, who is my neighbor? 
And you remember the story that he told of the man who fell among thieves and the Good Samaritan came along and took care of all that? I, I think we find that, don't we, in, what is it, uh, the Gospel of John, uh, seventh chapter, I think, 37. And, and, and from there on, I, I'm thinking it, it's there. Um, is it John or Luke? Well, anyway, we all know that we all know the story. And that the Good Samaritan did not know that man would fall among thieves, but he acted for that man as he obviously would have wanted that man to act in his case. He not only had fallen among thieves, but the Good Samaritan who took him to the inn, who poured in the oil and the wine, who bound up his wounds, also left the money with the innkeeper because he had to go on his way so that once he had fallen into thieves, the man would not fall into debt to the innkeeper for the other man having left there. He made, he made provision for him. That brings us to the word truth. We've done it with neighbor. What is truth? Truth, like the resurrection, is a person. Jesus said quite plainly, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if we want to speak truth without lying to our neighbor, we're bearing a true testimony about what Christ said about himself. We're not making up something out of whole cloth. We're not making up something about him because that's the way we would rather see him. And I believe that this in large portion deals with the doctrine that we believe or that we teach or that we preach. If we're going to do that, it better be truth because look at the next, um, uh, um, look what it says, putting away lying, speak every man truth to his neighbor for we are members one of another. Now we often in that, in that regard, in the church, we view the New Testament church as the body of Christ, and we should. But how many times do we look at it where it says we are members one of another as well? Notice that. Now, if you want a corroboration of that, we can go to uh, Romans 12, which is another epistle of Paul. And let's make sure we're not taking him out of context. Uh, Romans 12, 4 and 5. I believe that's what I'm looking for. For as we have many members in one body, that's the body of Christ, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. He says it again. So this is not a mistake on my part, nor is it a slip of the tongue on Paul's. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit here, he's telling us that we're not only members in our position, placed in the body of Christ where that Holy Spirit would have us be. But we are also members one of another in terms of how we get along in this life, you know, this side of the grave. Who do we go to, who do we go to church with? You know, who are, we, who are we fellowshipping with? And so forth. Now, here's the reason. Let's go back to that definition of what a lie is. A lie is told to the detriment of the hearer. And if we are to give either a false doctrine or a false statement or a false testimony, to a brother or a sister in Christ in the church or in our home. Now, who are we actually hurting if we're members one of another? The detriment is eventually to ourselves because we are members of that person as well. And they are members of us. And if we mean to give them something which is not true or part truth, do you see how you also are condemning yourself if that is to be believed as truth? Because there is no untruth that has any part of Christ. He's light and in him is no darkness at all. And it doesn't just extend to those that we uh, meet with, you know, on the Sunday down on the corner in the white building with the bell tower. No, it's anyone that the scripture might describe as our neighbor. And as we go back to the gospels and look for what Jesus taught us who our neighbor was, that's a pretty wide loop, isn't it? That's anybody with whom we would come in contact. And that's why I think we are told to give, you know, to be ready at all times to give to every man an answer for the reason of the hope that lies within you. And the reason of the hope that lies with men is a you know, with me. It's a scriptural hope. And as long as I'm staying with the scripture and give that, as we are this morning, looking at, for instance, Ephesians 4, then I'm standing on truth. I may misunderstand it. There may be something that I say may twist it somehow or other that you might misunderstand it. That's why we have a Holy Spirit to correct those things, because all scripture is given 
you know, uh, by God, inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, correction, reproof, and instruction in righteousness. And the Holy Spirit excels in all those things. So if you're depending on old brother Weber to give you the truth, don't. Depend upon, depend upon the Holy Spirit to prove to you what truth is again and again. Every time you open your Bible, every time you open your eyes, you seek, you'll find. You knock, it'll be opened unto you. He promised, that's his promise, not mine. And it isn't just to us because we happen to go to the same assembly. <laughs> it's to those that we know, that we pass on the street, that we meet at the post office, the grocery store, and so forth. Those are our neighbors. And we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. That's the second great commandment. <laughs> Verse 26, be ye angry and sin not. Can we think of a biblical example, perhaps, of how that might have been accomplished? Be ye angry and sin not. I can think of a time in the temple when those tables were overturned. I can think of the time when he was presented by the Pharisees with the man with the withered hand, you remember? And it says that he was angry because they were tempting him. What's he going to do? Is he going to do this on the Sabbath day? Is he going to do like he did before? Is he going to forgive sins? Is he going to try that? And he stood there and basically gave an in-your-face miracle. That hand was, was restored to wholeness, the same as the other hand. And then he had a story or two to tell him, but he was angry. <laughs> when it says, be angry and sin not, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now, is wrath different from anger? My response to that is, yes, it is. Wrath is active anger. I can be angry and do nothing. If I'm wrathful, I'm doing something. I'm uh, striking out. I'm uh, saying a few things. I'm uh, maybe doing a few things. And it will work itself out. And it expects now, in the same way that when Jesus was through cleansing the temple, he was done being angry. Look at what he's doing then. Look at what he's teaching then. Same way as when he had uh, restored the, the, the man with the withered hand. When he was done, when that anger was worked out, he doesn't hold on to it because eventually that will lead to what gets you in verse 31. It will, if you, if you coddle that and you keep it and you from day to day, letting the sun go down upon it as we're counseled not to, it becomes bitterness. It's bitterness is bottled up wrath and that will sour you against. And Paul's telling us, don't let it come to that because that'll affect all the rest of your testimony. You know how it is. When you're dealing with somebody who has a bitter spirit, it taints everything they say to you. You can practically taste their bitterness in your mouth. And Paul is teaching us not to let it come to that as we go along this, what we call our Christian walk. Now look, then in verse 27, neither give place to the devil. Hmm. Giving an opportunity. Now, if you go up and you attempt to do these things, which we're told not to, that's what you're doing. You're going to be giving, and I would be, giving the devil an opportunity in our lives, which is something I would recommend that we not do. And then he says in verse 28, let him stole, let him that stole steal no more. Well, yeah, we would like to hope that it, uh, a thief who comes to Christ would stop stealing because that would be a holy thing, wouldn't it? That's what we tell ourselves. Paul says that's not, that's not the object. Yes, he should stop stealing and steal no more, but let him, what, labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, that he might have to give to him that needeth. Let him honestly gain what he needs, and from that be able to select and share what someone else who may not have that opportunity might need. It's pretty much the same thing that, he, that Christ said when he went up uh, to the, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles at the temple. When he declared himself, you know, that he is a thirst come and take of these waters. And whosoever drink of this water, you know, shall never thirst again. And out of him, out of his belly, shall flow rivers of living water. You come in need to Christ. That need is fulfilled. And when he has finished with you, in that respect, he's never finished as far as the finished work until we're called home. But when he's finished with that repentance part. And he turns you around, which is repentance means, the change of mind. And you go back out there. What he has given you and what you are taking with you, which is his, his very spirit, 
you become a fountain of blessing to others. It's that life graciously lived among us that we notice. And this is what Paul is telling us in the soul. And it isn't really restricted to stealing. I don't care if it's stealing. I don't care if it's lying. I don't care what it is. Maybe covet. You stop that. You stop that. And you let, you take that mind, which is in Christ, which we are told, put on that new mind and the new man. Then that life of Christ begins to live in you. It's not a feigned thing. It's not, I'm holy because I dress this way or talk this way or act this way. I go here and I don't go there and I don't associate with this guy, but all of which one way or another is described by those who consider themselves holiness as holiness. It's not. Uh, modest dress is modest dress. It's not holiness. Holiness comes only from God. And I don't know what he wears. Do you? So how would we mimic that? No. I, and, I, and having said that, I believe in modest dress. But Putting on, but being modest does not make me holy. It makes me modest. Being truthful does not make me holy. It makes me truthful. But as these are attributes that God has expecting of his children, because these are attributes that he has shown of himself, as you reflect it, you are reflecting him in an honest and true light. Now do you see how you can, you can from the pulpit, you can say what is not true and it's a lie, and you can also live away which may look like truth, but is a lie. Putting on that, the, the, the skirt with the proper length hem, the shirt with the proper length sleeve, you, and, we, and we all know what I mean. That looks like holiness, but it is not. You portray it as holiness. That in itself is a lie without ever you opening your mouth. We are expected, and we are encouraged, we are expected by God, and we are encouraged by his apostle, I believe, in this epistle, to demonstrate who we are honestly to those who know us best to those who may only know us in a passing fashion that they're both going to see the same story lived out in our life among them that no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth verse 29 but that which is good to the use of edifying that it may minister grace to the earth do you see how that will work in school, it will work in church, it'll work in Sunday school, it'll work at the grocery store. Um, the way in which we speak, how we refer to others, are we building others up in the eyes of someone else or are we tearing them down, which is usually what gossip and backbiting is pretty good at doing. Uh, you may not have noticed that. Perhaps you have, as I have. Uh, we're asked not to do that. There are very few people that I know that I can honestly say I've never heard them say a bad word about another person. There are a few that I can say that about. And according to this epistle, we should all be better at it if, in fact, we have put on the new man. So that's one of the ways that we examine the fruit of a life lived among us. Does it actually demonstrate the action that we would expect from the body of Christ? That's an open question, and we every day that we live, we live an answer to that question, good or bad. Which brings us, let us no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying. That means building up. So it's more than just not saying something bad. We're to find something good. We're supposed to build up our brothers and sisters in Christ. And by doing that, we are supposed to give, uh, in, that, in that regard, in speaking with someone who may be in an unrepentant state, a reason for them to desire the life we have. Because we are the gospel that they see, whether we say it or not. We are the gospel that they see. That's usually where it begins. And then they'll ask the question about it. So we are to build them up that it may minister grace to the hearer. There's no distinction there about brother, sister, neighbor. It doesn't make, it's just to the hearer. And it goes back to why I believe what is my definition up there under verse 25. Every man speak truth with his neighbor. The neighbor is the one that we would like to have us treat us the way we would have, we, we were to treat him the way we would have him treat us. You know, it's the golden rule, as it were. We do better than that. If we're living out that life that is in us through the spirit that he gave us. 
and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you were sealed under the day of redemption. And this over and over I have heard taught, you know, you, you violate any of the stuff above here that Paul is talking about. You grieve the Holy Spirit. Now you've got to go back to the altar and repent. You've, you know, you've, you somehow you've lost the grace. You've lost, you, you cannot lose your salvation. This is not about salvation, brother, sister. Because look at those words, whereby you are sealed, present tense, unto the day of redemption. You can't, if you have that spirit, you can't lose it. But you can grieve it and you can break fellowship with it. Now that will cost us opportunity. It will cost us rewards, but it does not cost us salvation. There's nothing I can do which can undo the power of God unto salvation. I, 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 as a human being, I don't have that strength. He has the strength to hold me regardless of what I do. If I've truly repented, and that's why Paul, uh, Paul, that's why David could say, the believer, though he falls, shall not be utterly cast down. You're going to realize you fall, and you'll come to a place of repenting that which is you've tripped over. Usually it's something we've placed in our own way. At least that's the, you know, the experience of my life. I don't know how it is in yours. And he'll pick you up. He'll clean you off again, and you go on from there, re-empowered, ready to do that which he has suggested all along and planned all along for us. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger, see how those are lumped together? Bitterness is that bottle of wrath that's unexpressed. Wrath is the action that we would rather take, and anger is what produces it all. There's a righteous and an unrighteous anger. You know that. I know that. There are people who just like being angry, and they like calling uh, uh, customer support in, in uh, companies and then <laughs> never letting them satisfy them. Well, if that's the way you're going to run your company, I'll never buy another widget from you. You can count on and bang down goes the phone. There are some people who just like acting that way. Then there are others who are trapped into it because they cannot forgive. You want bitterness to roll up in you? Have something which has been a wrong against you. Don't forgive it. Go back and dwell on it. Go back and pick that scab again and again and again. And it will eventually embitter you. It will embitter me. And I believe that comes from an inability or an unwillingness to forgive, even if it has not been asked. There are some people who have done us wrong, who have you know since passed on. They can't ask. If you cannot forgive what has been done against you, even by those who are now posthumous, you will embitter yourself on that. Forgive it all. And the reason I'm saying that is because of verse 32. Be kind one to another. Tenderhearted. Forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Now, I don't mean to take God out of the picture, but I'm going back to where we are told that our Father God was reconciling the world unto himself in Christ while Christ was on the cross in order that he could and can righteously and justly forgive the sins that I create that I committed without that reconciliation through an acceptable sacrifice there is no way he could be just and righteous to forgive sins but that sacrifice was offered and so he justly can forgive the blood's been offered it's been accepted now I'm not saying that I can offer blood. I'm not saying that as, as good as he did it. I'm not saying that at all, if you understand what I'm trying to say here. I'm saying it's as he did it, and that's the willingness, that willing sacrifice, in, which is tied to us when Abraham uh, uh, went up with Isaac, and Isaac was willing you know, to be that sacrifice. God would not allow it, obviously. There was only one son that was going to be offered, and accepted, and that was going to be his own, nobody else's. But as Isaac was willing, as Christ was willing, and, and we see there in the garden where he says, not, not my will, but thy will. He's willing. We are, in that way, are to be willing to forgive one another. Do you see anything in verse 32 about wait until they ask for it? Because I don't. Christ died for me long before I was born. I couldn't ask, but he did he did it willingly. He did it efficaciously. All I had to do was accept it. I got the easy part. I still have the easy part. 
The hard part is the forgiving, but that's what we're called to do. And that's one of the hardest things for me. I really have, my carnal nature is very unforgiving and it has a pretty good memory. That is not what Christ has asked us to do. He has asked us to act as he would act in that situation. And that was forgiveness. Now you remember the woman who was taken in adultery. No question. This is an adulteress. This warranted stoning under the law. Now under the law, it also said that, that the person that she was caught with should also be there. She wasn't, but um, they bring her to see what he would do. And he knelt down, began to write in the dirt, and he's waiting. And then he looks up and he says, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And he went back to writing and doodling in the dirt again. And he looked up and they'd all gone away. Now look at his response to the woman. And he says, where are those who condemn you? And she says, there are none. And he says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. She was already forgiven. Neither do I condemn you. Now go and sin no more. Basically, that is, his, that is his call to us. No, uh, he does not condemn. He forgives. He empowers. He, en he, he enlivens. He does not condemn those who come to him. And that's why we are sealed by him under the day of our redemption. That is something we cannot lose. But if you grieve that spirit, now do you see where you've lost the fellowship of the one who can pour in that oil? can pour in that wine into the wounds that we carry daily. That's why I see in these, in these verses between 25 and 32, which last week I said so offhandedly was self-explanatory, why they are so precious and so meaningful. They give us a view of how we should act in the physical, demonstrating what Christ has done for us in the spiritual, which is far more important far more real and far more costly because he did it both ways. He did it spiritually and physically. Now, while we're living out this life, still in carnal flesh, we act physically. It's the only way we can act. But he has asked us to think and to contemplate with the mind of Christ and then to act in the new man and not the old one. And while we're doing that, to be tenderhearted with each other, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven us. I don't see a downside to that, and I do not see in the end, pursuing the 32nd verse, that there's any law, spiritual or, or a civil, that prohibits such action. And I would commend us all to that. I realize this is a little shorter study than uh, what I would normally bring, but that's what I have for the, uh, bringing us up to the 32nd verse of chapter 4 of the book of Ephesians. And Lord willing, next week, we will begin Ephesians chapter 5. Now, if Rick wants to open this up, if you have questions or comments, I'd be happy to take them at this point.